Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to charges that he tried to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Those efforts culminating in an explosion of violence in the U.S. Capitol that, of course, January 6, 2021. This is the third criminal trial the former president is facing as he mounts another run at the White House. Polling suggests the criminal charges are only strengthening his position in an increasingly polarized America. One prominent U.S. pollster is warning Canada to beware of what's happening in his country. Everything that I thought was impossible is now happening. So if you ask me how bad can it get, I don't know. But I know it can be a lot worse. And I know that whatever happens here is coming to you all. Please, Canada, don't follow America. I can't believe I'm saying it, but I believe it. Don't follow where we are. However, a new report suggests Canada is already following that it has a polarization problem. Justin Ling is a Montreal-based freelance journalist. He authored the Pol Public Policy Forum's new report. It's titled Far and Widening, the Rise of Polarization in Canada. Justin, very good to have you again on the program. Hey, and David, thanks for having me. I wanted to start with um, something that's just quite striking at the end of the report. And I, I'll read it out loud here. Canadians are angry and they are picking sides, increasingly segmenting into agitated clusters of comforting rage. How did you arrive there? I, you know, I'll start by saying that Canadians generally agree that polarization is a problem. You look at any polling that gets done, we did some ourselves, but a whole bunch of other pollsters have found the same thing. People tend to feel like this country is polarizing. They're seeing it in their own lives. They're experiencing their communities. They're seeing it on the news. And they're starting to get anxious about it. And it's coming from a bunch of different directions. They're seeing it on social media. That phrase, agitated clusters of comforting rage, um, it comes from a really smart um, a pol political scientist, Wendy Chun, who wrote a fantastic paper about exactly that question. She writes about kind of Facebook and the way in which social media creates these really fake communities where everyone's sort of held together by their hatred of something, right? People see that, that anger and that hatred and that frustration, uh, but they also see the ways in which political parties and political leaders have drifted apart in such significant ways to the point where now partisans don't see anything in common with partisans of a different stripe. You know, they're seeing the ways in which this country is facing some really big problems, yet our political system, our democracy, our media seems really incapable of mediating those conflicts in any reasonable way. So. In the report, I sort of say, we know polarization is here because Canadians know it when they see it. And they're seeing it and they're reporting it. And so now it's time to figure out what's causing it and how we can work to kind of relieve that pressure. So if we are in a world of us and them, what is that source? What is the cause? Yeah, we kind of identify three big trends that have sort of contributed to polarization. One is the rise of hyperpartisanship, mm -hmm. and that's been driven by a demand for money, right? Fundraising has become a constant anxiety for every single political party. Um, we see the impact that online campaigning has had on those parties, the constant demand to whip up anger because anger works better online than anything else. Um, and, and really the decline in, in sort of of middle ground between the parties or overlap between the parties, the way in which the parties are now sort of drifting apart. That polarization problem is one huge factor that's been happening for more than a decade. Social media and the internet is the second part. It sort of exacerbates those partisan problems. Social media sort of pits us against each other. It, it, it gives very little grace in conversations. It uh, pushes us, thanks to some of the algorithms developed by Google and Facebook and others, into those agitated clusters of comforting rage. And the third thing we talk about is the pandemic. The pandemic is sort of a force, a force multiplier for those first two variables. It made us, as one indigenous leader phrased it to me, sort of add up the score of our divisions and our disagreements and uh, really made those first two factors all the more potent. Even alongside polarization, of course, there's just disgust and detachment from the political system itself that people are like, oh, look at what they did in Parliament. Look at this party or those guys did today. I wonder what politicians themselves are thinking about polarization. They know it's a problem. 
and they know they're contributing to it, and they know that their contribu contributions to it is making it worse, and it's, 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 it's creating what we call an, a rage arms race. You know, I spoke to members of parliament from all parties, all off the record, sort of on background, anonymous, so they could speak freely, and they're really blunt. They know what they're doing is making their own supporters angry. I mean, members of parliament are getting death threats from their own members and their own supporters. That is a really bizarre and troubling sign. And the constant demands for anger are making these partisans and these supporters angry, of course, but it's also then demanding, causing a demand from them to their, uh, their leaders to become angrier in return. Uh, Aaron O'Toole phrased this really well in his uh, goodbye speech to Parliament just a few weeks ago, where he said, we need to be followers again, and sorry, we need to be leaders again, mm -hmm. not followers of our followers. I thought that phrased it really, really well. The ways in which they're constantly demanding money is a high emotion, uh, anger-inducing, fear-invoking appeal, and it's happening constantly in supporters' email inboxes, uh, on social media, sometimes at the doorstep, and it's creating this, this vicious cycle of anger and disgust and distrust, uh, and it's making such that compromise is impossible, and compromise has become a dirty word. Uh, we need to break out of this process, and unfortunately, there's no incentive right now for any of our political leaders to do so. It's kind of kind of be up to us to demand something better. But is that because it works? Yeah, I mean, to some degree it is. And you know what? The media is 100% to blame for this as well. Over the years, we've found that, uh, you know, anger-inducing headlines perform significantly better online than headlines that evoke hope or optimism. In fact, headlines that use anger as an emotion have increased 300% just over the last decade or so. So the media has discovered it's worked. Partisans and politicians have discovered it works. But the problem is it's for short-term gain. In the medium and long term, you set yourself up into these smaller and smaller boxes. We're pushing people out of the political scenes. Those who don't enjoy this hyper-partisanship are unplugging or getting disenchanted with the process. So yeah, maybe you can raise a little more money in the short term. Maybe you're able to win that one by-election or that leadership race. But in the long run, we're baking our democracy into this really acrimonious, unproductive uh, system that is not delivering results for anybody. And we desperately need an adult in the room to stand up and say, we have to do something different. And the reality is, every single party is to blame for this. Sometimes, some more than others. But every single party plays this game, and nobody is the one really standing up and saying, we have to do things differently. Justin Lang, fascinating discussion. Uh, I, I, I wish we had time to go on more, but I know that this is um, a long-standing issue. And we will be talking to you, no doubt, again about it as we try to find the off-ramp to political sanity. Justin, thank you. Thanks, David.